Basically, what we are going to be talking today here is uh, seeing how SAP is uh, resistant or, or which kind of attacks can be done actually to SAP web applications and what companies can do to prevent that. What I can promise is that we're going to be trying to avoid a very boring and long theoretical uh, talk. We're going to, I think we have like seven live demos of, of attacks to SAP web applications, so I hope you, you enjoy it. A quick introduction to Onapsis. Onapsis is a company that is focused on the security of ERP systems as business critical applications. So we are mainly talking about SAP, but we are also working on other ERP platforms like Siebel, Oracle, Business Suite, PeopleSoft, and JD Edwards. We're working with large companies in this sense. I mean, large companies use these systems. And well, we have some software. Uh, I invite you to download Bisploits and Onapsis Integrity Analyzer. They are open source tools that you can get from our website. We also have Onapsi X1, that's a commercial tool to do SAP security assessment. Um, well, we provide different kind of services that you can also find in, in our website. I don't want to bore you with that. Uh, about myself, I'm the CEO at Onapsis. I have discovered, I come from the vulnerability research and penetration testing fields. And then I started digging into the SAP world. So I have been uh, holding trains and presentations in, in some conferences. Um, I was also the developer of the first SAP and ERP penetration testing framework. And also I'm the lead author of the Subsecurity in-depth publication that I invite you also to download it from our website. It's, it's a free publication with, with very in-depth technical security aspects of SAP systems. So uh, in these 50 minutes, we are going to be talking about a very quick interaction to the SAP world how the threats to SAP system has been evolving over the last years, which are the different SAP web application servers, which are the threats to these application servers, and how these attacks can be performed. I would like to know how many of you use SAP in your company, or have, well, pretty much. Um, so I think you all get quite interested in, in some of the things that we're talking about. For the ones that uh, have not raised uh, their hands, uh, basically, SAP is the largest provider of business management solutions in the world. These are just uh, some of their numbers. They have more than 140,000 SAP implementations around the globe, and over 90,000 customers use SAP around the world. And they use SAP, I mean, this, we're talking about Fortune 500 companies, governmental entities, military organizations, and they're using this kind of systems not to do like their, not to, to support their intranet, they use the system to actually run the most critical business processes. So we are talking about financial planning, invoicing, selling, uh, procurement, managing the payroll. Everything that is, is uh, the most important information and processes of the company is being run and processed through, the, uh, through these systems. So that's why we, told, or we say that uh, these are the crown jewels of the company, right? So what we're talking about is uh, about the security aspects of standard SAP web applications. So, uh, just for you to understand, we are not talking about uh, whether how you deploy or how you develop your own SAP web applications and if you are exposed to cross-site scripting or, or SQL injections or this kind of attacks, that's going to be covered in a future talk. What we are talking about is about threats to the core and standard web application servers. So no matter which application, custom application you are running, you may be susceptible to this kind of, of, of issues. So how the threats to SAP systems have been evolving? I think that the main problem when actually I, I did in DeepSec in 2007, one of my first presentations on, on SAP security, and back then I, I, I even had a, a harder time challenging uh, what SAP security actually means. The problem with SAP security from my point of view is that it has been traditionally regarded as a segregation, as a synonym of segregation of duties controls. So if you have never heard about segregation of duties, it basically means that, okay, make sure that if a user uh, team can create a new vendor, he cannot create purchase orders to that vendor, right? Otherwise, he can uh, make a, a very easy kind of fraud. So this is mapped into a matrix. Yes, usually Excel, Excel sheets are used for this. Uh, which is translated in SAP to transaction or authorization objects. And basically, SAP security is checking your user authorizations against an Excel sheet or a matrix. So what we see right now is that many organizations have SAP security in place. 
So they are spending a lot of money uh, by having a dedicated human resources team and, and expensive software licenses to, to serve this purpose. But the main problem that, uh, that we uh, found or that we are facing is that this is also providing a false sense of security, right? Because companies and managers see that they have the people there, they have the software, so they think they're taking care of the security of the SAP systems. And the important thing to highlight is that while these kind of controls are necessary, they are not enough, right? So, so if you think about an SAP system, like a layer stack here on the right, where you have an operating system, a database, what we call the business runtime and the business logic layer, the segregation of duty control is only applied to this layer. However, what we detect is that this layer that is usually called NetWeaver or basis layer is prone to, just as any other piece of software is prone to security vulnerabilities that if it gets exploited, will provide uh, an attacker access to, to perform really serious attacks to the business information. And if you stop to think it uh, for a minute, for someone to exploit the segregation of duties violation, he will, first to, he will first need to have a user account in the system, right? So you will need to have a malicious employee or user that suddenly discovers that he has more authorizations than he should have, and he can perform certain activities that he should not be able to do. However, by exploiting vulnerabilities in the lower layers, the attacker doesn't even need a user account in the system in many cases, okay? In many default installations of SAP, an attacker just by knowing the IP address of the system and being able to connect to certain services that are usually or always open, uh, he can end up compromising the system fully, right? So there was a, a something that was definitely not right here. We also see that the, the, the threat is rising. This is a chart that we made about the number of SAP security nodes released each year. So in 2005, we were talking about less than 20 security nodes per year. And in 2010, just in 2010, we were almost at 900 SAP security nodes, right? SAP in December released over 500 security nodes. Yeah, so administrators didn't have a very a happy Christmas, I guess. Um, and this year, uh, I think that we are already almost around 700 security nodes, but you cannot tell whether it's going to be 750 or it's going to be, uh, I don't know, 2,000 until we get to December and, and see what happens. Um, so this, obviously, the larger number of security nodes, the larger number of, of known vulnerabilities, um, in some way, the, the more easy it would be for an attacker to reverse any of these patches and, and exploit some of these vulnerabilities. This is one of also the main problems in SAP landscape is that customers do not apply patches very promptly. So uh, I'm often asked uh, what SAP is doing about all these threats and stuff. Well, uh, I have been working with SAP um, reporting security vulnerabilities since 2006. I think I, I, I made the first presentation on, on SAP security attacks or threats in Black Hat Amsterdam in 2007. And I can really see that they are moving to, to adapt to this new reality. Uh, back then, it was quite a, a bit of a surprise for them. But now things are getting better. And you can see that in each new release. The problem is that many customers are still using old releases. And it's not really that easy to upgrade to a new release. So that's why many customers are at risk at this point. So let's get into the, the core of the subject. And let's start talking about the different SAP web application servers. So there are, I mean, once you get used to uh, an SAP acronym or a name or a solution, uh, SAP is going to change it, yeah? So don't put too much effort into remembering names or anything. The first one, the first SAP web application server uh, released by SAP is the Internet Transaction Server, the ITS. So it was released in 1996, and it's basically a middleware, right? So I, I'm not sure if it's very clear, but you can see it here. Basically, the user connects to a component called WGate, that is a, like an ESAPI filter running on a web server, like Apache or, or IIS. This server translates, its, uh, sorry, this, this uh, filter sends the, the um, traffic to another component that is called the Agate, and this sends it to the SAP system. So basically, the ITS is translating between HTML pages or HTTP traffic to SAP traffic or pages, right? 
So it's, it's like a conversion and translation system. So that was the first approach. The second approach was the ICM, or the second solution of web server is the ICM. It's basically the evolution of the ITS component, and now the kernel itself of the SAP system has been enhanced to support HTTP and SMTP protocols. So you don't need any more a middleware. Yeah. So the first thing that you should tell your customers or think about yourself is that the fact that you don't need a middleware doesn't imply that you sh just plug it to the internet directly. Yes. Please put a reverse proxy in the middle and place it in a DMC. Otherwise, you could be in, in, in high problems. So for you, we're going to get into the, uh, deeper into this, but uh, have the idea that what you're accessing when you access the ICM is an ICF service. So it would be like a PHP or an ASP page. It's, it, it would be the equivalent for that. And finally, you have the Enterprise Portal. Enterprise Portal is the latest web technology from SAP. The idea is that it provides a unique access point to the organization's SAP and even non-SAP system through the web. So here you can see some, some examples of how it looks like. Um, technically, this one is running on a, it's, it's basically it's a very complex Java application running on a, on a SAP a G2 EE engine. Um, and, it, and it's basically the latest thing that you can find uh, from SAP regarding web access, right? So ITS, ICM, Enterprise Portal, yeah, for customers, sometimes it's a bit difficult to, to choose what to use. And, and you may find many of them running at the same time. So let's start going into the, the exploitation of SAP web apps. One of the th things that we usually find when we talk about SAP web apps is like, oh, really, I, I don't really care because my SAP is only used internally. So what that could be true, like, more than a decade ago, now it's very common to find SAP systems online. And attackers know how to find them. Uh, these are just two silly examples. Uh, are you familiar with Shodan? Uh, yeah, yep. Well, for, for the ones that know, Shodan is basically a search engine that allows you to search for um, um, web servers. You, you can specify like, like a string here, and it will search for that string in the server header of, of web servers indexed online. So here, uh, you cannot see it, but it has almost like 2,000 results. Uh, of, and these are like 2,000 SAP systems connected to the internet, right? Also, you can use some Google Docs to search for SAP systems online, and you will be quite surprised to see the names of the brands that are, are actually exposing their SAP systems to the internet. So if you think that your SAP system is not public, at least make these uh, uh, quick checks to, to make sure it's not, at least it's not listed there. So why, why do I say that this is, uh, I mean, the web, SAP web, web apps are the attacker's dream? If you start to think it, uh, for an external attacker to compromise a backend SAP system, he has to reach or to go through several defense layers, right? Like DMCs, IPS, uh, firewalls, uh, whatever. And so it's kind of hard, but he enjoys the privileges of being harder to catch. Yes, he's in a remote country, and in a foreign country that it's very difficult to get him uh, to law or whatever. On the other hand, internal attackers have much more power. Usually, SAP systems are not segregated internally, so there are not internal uh, DMCs for SAP servers, so they have access to full ports, full services, and that brings uh, a lot of power to them, but they're more prone to detection. However, if, I mean, your SAP web apps are not implemented securely, securely you're basically having, uh, giving the attacker the best of both worlds. And we're going to see why is that. So let's talk about the attacks. Uh, I kind of divided this in a, in a very uh, progressive way. So we're going to first talk about quickly about identification. This is very uh, uh, silly or, 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 or easy. The idea is that just as any web server, SAP also returns the server header in HTTP responses so you can use this information as an attacker to identify uh, which is the particular SAP web application running on that uh, IP address or that port. So in the, ITAs, in the ITS, it's not possible because I told you it's like a filter, so you get the IIS or the Apache header, uh, but the ICM and the Java engine that is the one running the enterprise portal, you get quite descriptive uh, header messages, so you can really fingerprint uh, which is the application running on the background. 
this is how you can, I mean, we also going to see how you can protect against this or, or this information disclosure in this kind of like pop-ups. Uh, so I will leave that for you as a reference. Uh, as an attacker, you can also explore the systems. You can trigger some special requests that will, uh, you can send special requests that will trigger some maybe er error conditions or uh, easy things just as analyzing the source code. For instance, in the ITS, if you try to access a non-existent service, like uh, with this kind of, uh, of uh, syntax, it will show this kind of uh, error or, or login, uh, login screen. And also, if you analyze the source code, you can get the very exact uh, version, right? So this is very useful for, uh, for an advanced stage on the attack where you, uh, as an attacker, you need to find out which exploit uh, you're going to launch. In the ICM, it's pretty much the same. You can trigger uh, uh, 404 or 403 messages, and the attacker, I mean, there is uh, like a disclosure of information here. You can see the host name. You can see the subsystem ID that is very useful for some further attacks. This, this would be like the name of the system, and also the system number. In Portal, it's also very easy. Just right click, view source, and you have the exact version of the Portal runtime. Uh, over there in some HTML comments. This is how you protect against this. But let's start really getting into something more serious and more interesting. And we're going to start talking about attacks to the ICM first, right? So I told you that when you access the ICM, you're going to be accessing an ICF service. Right? And by default, there are over 1,500 standard ICF services in a typical SAP ERP installation. So this would be equivalent to, one, uh, to 1,500 ASP or PHP pages that you, are, you run when you install the system. So each of these one will receive parameters and will perform certain activities on that parameters, right? So there are injection points. When uh, the ICM receives a, a request for one of these services, the following procedure will take place. First of all, the system will check if it's public or private, right? If it's public, it will just give you the content or, or do what it needs to do. And if it's not, uh, if it's a private uh, service, it will check for certain things that uh, really doesn't, go, doesn't do many, uh, many good to go into detail. But basically, it will trigger an authentication mechanism, right? So if uh, the user authenticates successfully, then it will check if, you, if the user has authorization to run that specific service, and if he has, uh, the service code is executed. So to be fair, most of the services require authentication, yes, but we will see why this cannot be so much of a barrier for an attacker. Anyway, for instance, here we have a public service that is installed by default. It's called the public, uh, sorry, the info service. So this is basically the URL that, uh, where this is published, so it would be like, ip.port slash sap slash public slash info. Um, without authentication, this service will uh, give you an, an XML uh, or a SOAP actually response uh, where you can see the system ID, you can see uh, the, where the database host is stored, which, you can see which database engine it's, it's using, the SAP release, the operating system that is being used, internal IP addresses, so very useful information from an attacker to, to also to an advanced stage. But let's really get a bit more serious. So I told you that most services require authentication, right? And I told you that also once the user authenticates, the system will check if he has authorizations to run that service. The problem number one that we found is that Actually, the authorization check usually does not apply because services are by default not assigned to an authorization group, let's call it that way. So the default behavior is that, okay, do not check for authorization. So that means that the, att the attacker will only need a user account in the system. Yes, it doesn't matter that much how many privileges that user have, and he will be able to access the service then he will be obviously be subject to code level authorization checks, but at least he can access the system with any, uh, the service, sorry, with any user. 
And the second, while it can sound a bit silly, you will be surprised on, I mean, we, we are regularly doing SAP pen tests for very large companies, and you will be quite surprised to see how common, I think, actually, in all the pen tests that we did, we found at least one, uh, systems are configured with default users and passwords. So these are the default users, like Substar, Dedic, Early Watch, Sub CPIC, and TMS IDM, and they have publicly known uh, default passwords. So the attacker has a lot of chances to find one of these configured. And as an additional note, the attacker can also clo uh, control which mandant or client is something very SAP specific. But I mean, what you want to get out of this is that, OK, an attacker needs authentication, but there will be no authorization check. And it's highly probable that he can find a user, a default user, to trigger that service. So what this turns out to be is that the attacker has fair chances of accessing really sensitive uh, business functionality through the ICM services. And we're going to see some uh, demos of that. In particular, we're going to talk about one service that is called SOAP RFC. So the RFC, the RFC uh, is a special uh, proprietary SAP protocol that is used to call uh, function models, yes, to, to call uh, function modules in remote SAP servers. So this is what we actually presented, our first presentation in Black Hat, and here actually at DeepSec, we presented a lot of threats to this interface, uh, and a lot of ways into an attacker can exploit weaknesses in this interface. But from an external point of view, this protocol, or, or, or the interface implemented this protocol, is not usually accessible from the internet, right? However, there is an ICF service that can be used to perform RFC calls. So if this service is enabled, that is also usually is enabled, an attacker can perform RFC calls to the web application server just as he was sitting in the, in the local network. That's why I told you about this paradigm of, of like having been external but having like the internal power right, from an attacker point of view. I know the, the, this looks a bit like ugly, right? So let's go a little bit into detail before the demo. This is a, an SA, a user on an SAP server uh, with an overly simplified version of, of an SAP server where you have the web application uh, server interface and the SAP RFC interface and the operating system, right? So from the uh, internal network, the user gets access to, through HTTP to the web server and through RFC to the RFC interface. However, from the internet, the RFC connection is, is stopped at the firewall, right? It only allows web connections. However, what the attacker would do is <coughs> trigger this special SOAP RFC service, that this is an ICF service, to call RFC function modules. And we're going to see what that actually can mean. So I'm going to make the, the first demo. Um, oh, sorry, first of all. So actually, the first demo is uh, about, sorry about that. It would be like a, a very simple case of a sabotage attack, right? So uh, this is Subwe. This is like the, the client that is used to connect to an SAP system. So I'm going to be connected to the system, right? I'm going to be, I mean, this, this, is, this would be the, the, the end user using the system to create vendors, whatever. So we're going to use an exploit. I want you to, to actually, I will make this, I'm oh, sorry. Well, I wanted to do exactly the opposite. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to do it now. So what I'm going to do, be, uh, be doing here, I'm going to show you the exploit. I don't want to do like black magic. Basically, well, this this uh, doesn't matter. But basically, what it's doing is, this is the, the key part, right? So it's making a, a SOAP call. I mean, you you I have to do it with a like a Python script because it's only POST. I cannot do it with a like with a GET. Otherwise, I would do it with a browser. But basically, this is going to be calling for a, a function model, an RFC function model through a SOAP call through the uh, web uh, interface, right? And we're going to see what that means. So if you see that we have the screen here, the user is logged in, and after we run this, 
the windows is closed, right? So basically, that what attacker is doing is, is uh, logging off all the users connected to the SAP system through the web application, right? So you can imagine that, uh, I mean, companies, most of their employees are just, I mean, their everyday work is running the SAP transactions, right? So an attacker could be like, you could put this in a loop, right? And, and continuously log off every user in the company. So obviously that will uh, mean some costs for, for the organization because employees will probably need to go home. So that's a very simple uh, sabotage attack. The second one, uh, it's actually also a bit silly, is uh, about uh, spamming through the same way, right? So uh, I'm going to connect again to the system. So, okay, so I'm connected here. And I'm going to use another exploit or another, yeah, soap call that is called spam. That is basically the same, uh, it's like another payload, right? It's uh, the same attack vector like calling an RFC function model remotely. And you see that what, what the, user, the user will get in his, in his screen uh, is uh, spam messages from the attacker remotely, right? This is the, the sub we uh, screen. But I know, I mean, this is just uh, funny things. Oh, let me, I forgot to do something. Uh, so let's get more serious here. Let's use the, so we'll do the demo number three from the web to the shell. Sorry. Uh, no. So I'm going to launch this exploit Oh, sorry. So um, I'm, I mean, I would, I'm pretending to be the attacker here. So this is, oh, sorry, you cannot see that. So this is my username. Um, this is my, my IP address, right? Oh, well, the attack was triggered. <laughs> I couldn't stop it on time. Let me close it. Uh, so this is my IP address, right? So I will trigger the exploit, and what the attacker gets is basically, I don't know if you can see that, uh, it's a, a next term, right, in the 3.4, yes. So this is actually the remote SAP system, yes. So he's getting a, a remote shell through a, he's making a SOAP request and getting an external shell, yeah? I'm going to explain that in a minute. But obviously if the attacker, I mean, if this is not comfortable enough, he can also use like something like Nautilus and get um, a graphical file browser to, to go through the SAP system remotely. So he can get into, I don't know, file system, um, use your user, SAP, and he has full access to the system, let's say the system profiles, anything that is on the remote SAP server. So that's actually a full compromise of the SAP system through uh, a weak ICF service. What is the self request for that one? Sorry? What is the self request for that one? I, I'm, going to I'm going to explain it now, yeah. I know that uh, this can sound a bit strange, right? So what, sorry, uh, what actually happened over there? The attacker is doing, I told you we could execute RFC function models. So what we are doing, then I can show you the code, the attacker is basically sending a SOAP request to execute a function model that is called thgrep, right? So this function model, the, the legitimate use for that is to search for strings in files. And what's really important is that this can be executed by the early watch user that is one of the standard users that are thought to be like, uh, yeah, I don't care about early watch. It, it doesn't have many privileges, right? So uh, a friend of mine from uh, the Netherlands discovered a common injection vulnerability in the RFC module. So actually what we're doing is, okay, from the web, we are triggering a call to an RFC function module that we are injecting operating system commands to get to the operating system layer. And just for the demo uh, purposes, 
where what we're executing is exporting the display and getting an, an extern back, right? So that's why you could get the extern. But obviously, uh, that will require an outbound connection. That, that it's that not that difficult to, to find uh, like weak firewalls, but that's not really necessary, right? That's just for the demo effect. But once the attacker is running operating system commands at that point with that kind of privileges, he's already the full owner of the system and he can access any kind of, of, syst of uh, uh, business information, right? Uh, so that's what, what happened. So anyway, when we do this kind of test, uh, we usually, I mean, if we go to a manager and we show them that uh, we could get a command shell with a reverse connection, with exporting display, they will look at us and say, okay, yeah, I have uh, to play golf tomorrow and I don't care really much about what you're talking about. So uh, what we try to do always is to show what this actually could mean to the business, right? So what I'm going to do now is to uh, use other exploits that will actually uh, mean something for, for the business. Let me close this. Um, Okay, so I'm, again, I'm, what I'm doing, I'm going to show it here. Again, that's another RFC call. And the RFC function model that we're using is RFC read table. So it's basically a function model that allows uh, people to read uh, SAP tables, right? Um, so I'm going to call this. And what you will see is that uh, there is, uh, it returns this XML output, so I'm going to, to send it to a file for us to be able to see it uh, in a better way, right? Um, okay. So, the attacker, again, the attacker through the web is executing a function module that allows him to read tables. What he's reading in this case, he's reading the tables with the credit card transactions of the SAP system. So uh, here you have like the MasterCard, the credit card number, and the amount of the operation. You have here the names of the guys that were running these transactions. So uh, this obviously uh, could mean something for the PCI guys, right, uh, that are over there. Um, so this is one example. You can read tables from credit card transactions. Uh, another two examples are, I'm going to execute another that is basically accessing another table. So we're going to refresh that. And in this case, what attacker can get, for instance, is the, all the human resources payroll information. So everything that you see here, this is like the personal number, the name of the employee, the uh, birth date, where, in which state he lives, and I don't remember clearly, but one of the others were like um, sex, uh, religion, uh, so this one here. This, uh, these bytes uh, also reflect religion things or, and sex and, and, and other things. Uh, so let's make a quick example. Let's say, okay, Julia White. So let's copy the personal number of Julia White We'll execute the last exploit regarding this because we have to look it up in another table. And what the attacker will get is, okay, this is how much Julia White earns a year, right? She earns 56,000 euros a year. Uh, so obviously this is quite an interesting disclosure of information. What's important to also mention is that, I mean, we are using function models that can only, that are used to retrieve data, right? This is espionage only. But the attacker can also use function models to modify the data. So if he's a friend of Julia White, he can maybe add a zero here, and Julia will have a great holidays in, in, in Cancun or whatever. Um, so this is completely possible to be done over the, the internet. So. Let's get back to this. Oh, sorry, I had to do some. Um, let's 
um, switch of the VMware's. Any questions so far? I can take one question. Maybe in the meanwhile. All these bugs that you find in the software services, they have been found with blind testing of the web service itself or reversing the server testing? Well, actually, I, I, I wouldn't say it's a bug. I would say it's like a, a, a abuse of functionality. Because yeah, the. I mean, all these function names and calls are documented somewhere? Not all of them, no. The, uh, the ones, yeah. Okay, so let's go back to it. Yeah, actually, well, this ROC function models that we have executed, there are uh, over 25,000 ROC function models in a, in a standard recipe installation. So you can definitely find a lot of things to do. So again, this is how you protect against this. The, this well, actually, the, 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 the one that we use to execute operating system commands has been patched, uh, and there are uh, some ways into how you can protect against the, some of these uh, threats. The most important thing here is to disable the SOAP ROC service uh, to, to just uh, close it at, the, at there, yeah, stop it there. Well. So finally, I want to talk about something I, uh, I actually discovered uh, regarding the security of enterprise portals that I think you will find quite interesting. So I told you that Enterprise Portal was the latest web technology, right, from SAP. So uh, Enterprise Portal supports different authentication mechanisms, such as user, typical user and password, client certificates, uh, logon tickets, that's uh, SAP proprietary, Kerberos, and many different uh, authentication models. Actually, authentication is handled by the Java engine, right, not by the Enterprise Portal. So what we're talking about actually is really affecting the Java engine, so it doesn't matter which kind of uh, application you're running on top, if it's Portal, PI, uh, uh, Solman, whatever. The thing is that uh, many organizations already have like web access management or enterprise access management solutions in place, and they want to integrate that with, with enterprise portals. So maybe they want to use to integrate them because they want to do single sign-on, or maybe they want to increase the security of the solutions by uh, for instance, adding like a two-factor authentication and providing like, access through tokens, biometrics, or things like that. So these are some examples of uh, solutions that integrate with SAP enterprise portals uh, that allows you to perform this kind of single sign-on or increase authentication procedure. So in order to do this integration, in order for you to authenticate, let's say, with an RSA token, and that that token is being validated with the portal and grants you access to the portal, uh, SAP uses something called header variables login module. That it works like this. Yeah, it's just for you to, ref to have as a reference, but we're going to see it in uh, graphically. Oh, sorry, first of all, let me check that. Well, I, I can check it later. Okay, so how this works. We have the user that's going through a firewall. We have the authentic authentication proxy. This two would be like the, the enterprise access management or web access management solution. And you have the enterprise portal, right? So the user sends the credentials to the authentication proxy. This could be user and password, or it could be like the token. It could be the biometric information, anything. So the proxy will check in its own directory whether this is valid or not. So if it's valid, it will say OK, and the authentication proxy will connect to the enterprise portal with this header variables login module and tell him, OK, authenticate this user. Enterprise portal will say OK, and the user will get his cookie that he will use to keep on connecting to the portal. What's the problem here? What if the attacker can connect directly to the portal and, and like kind of impersonate the authentication proxy? So let's see how this actually looks like. I think that some of you may already imagine what we are going to do. Uh, sorry, 3.6, okay. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is to access the enterprise portal system. Yeah, this, is a, uh, this is a login screen for enterprise portal. I'm going to show you that this is running. I'm going to log in as administrator. Oh, I have to change. <coughs> OK. 
Okay, so the administrator is happily using the, the system and everything works right. So let's close this, let's open a new one. And let's also open our friend verb. Okay, so let's say now that uh, this is an attacker that faces, I mean, he has discovered the SAP Enterprise Portal online and he uh, accessed it, sorry, he accessed the URL and uh, he's faced with this authentication. Uh, um, screen, right? So he will try administrator and he will do like a long shot, okay, admin. Okay, this doesn't work. Uh, so company name, okay, this doesn't work. So he will try, instead of doing this, he will try a different thing. He will use verb. Is anyone, everyone familiar with verb? Right? Yeah, okay, right. I, I can skip that. Um, so we will set verb, I think it's already set for intercept, yeah. Um, so the attacker will click, I mean, no user, no password, right? This is a very, very complex attack, so pay attention. Um, so the user clicks on logon, right? And the only thing that he will have to do is add a special header, in this case called remote user, with the username he would like to be. So he sets this forward. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, Obviously, when, when I, I was starting to, to, when I discovered this, I was really surprised and, and kind of excited, I had to admit. Uh, but it was even worse, actually, then I also, I mean, I started founding, or, or sorry, uh, searching for it online to see if there was anyone else who had done it or, or anything else. And I actually found that this was somehow documented in, in some SAP formal documentation since 2006. Okay, so we're talking about five years ago. It's a feature, yeah, it's a design problem, let's say that way. So it's important to read the documentation, right? Um, yeah, the main problem here is that, I mean, how you can actually, you have, it, you have here the countermeasure. The, the main problem or, or the main uh, way to solve this is to avoid this guy connecting directly to the portal, okay? So the, the, what he's doing actually is, is impersonating the authentication proxy. So you have to make all your users and attackers go through the firewall and speak to the authentication proxy, not directly to the portal. That's the way uh, into how you can protect this. And, and it's actually, if you think about this, uh, we're talking about high profile organizations who have thought about increasing the security and, and the, the authentication to the systems, right? And if they're failing to do that properly, they're actually making it much worse. They're just making it anonymous, right? Um, so it's really important to, to actually we, we did an assessment of a customer that they implemented all this, but as users in the first place, they co not connected through a firewall, they, I mean, they, ch they changed it user URLs to connect to authentication proxy, but the firewall was, st was still open to, the for, to access the enterprise portal directly. So the attacker can still go through that hole. That's, that's a, the, the key point. Um, yeah. Yeah. In so in that case, uh, you have a reverse proxy in front of Tomcat, for example. Tomcat is listening on AJP, so you couldn't access like, the, the application server. Exactly. That's the point. That, that's how you secure that. You, you have to force everyone to go through that channel. Ah, so this is, okay, so nobody is doing that. Exactly, yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, well, I, I wouldn't say no one. I would say that we found cases where People were not doing that, yeah. Um, okay, finally, last thing to talk about, uh, some post-exploitation things. 
I mean, once the attacker has access to enterprise portal, as administrator, he can do everything he wants. He can access business information, anything. And he may try also to, um, to install a backdoor to secure future access to the system, right? Um, so, well, this is some background information. But just to make the long story short, as you have the ASP shell, the PHP shell, GSP shell, we, uh, we realized that it was not a, a sub-portal shell, right? <coughs> So basically, what we did was uh, a par shell. Par is the name of the portal application. Stands for it's like similar to a WAR file. And um, let's see how that looks like. So once the attacker has full access, he can go to this convenient tool that's called Portal uh, Archive Deploy and Remover. Browse his files. Uh, upload the portal shell shell up. Upload, and then he has this URL for the future access, and he can do anything he wants. Right? So this would be like a, a partial for for enterprise portals. Um, okay, um, further attacks. Yeah, it's really impossible to, to talk everything uh, that we can about uh, attacks to web applications. I just wanted to highlight two more things. The first one is uh, the verb tampering attacks. I know if you're familiar with the presentation that was, uh, was done in Black Hat this year in the US by a Russian security researcher called Alexander Polyakov. Uh, he uh, discovered that uh, some of the Java web applications were prone to verb tampering attacks. So let's say, to make it easier, if you don't know the term, it's like, they were restricting the get and post uh, methods, but you could still use, uh, use a head method to, uh, to access that. And it's really a, a very important uh, vulnerability because it will allow anyone to create an administrator user uh, anonymously, so really critical. Um, also, something that uh, you can check on our website is uh, something we call invoker server the tour attacks that also will allow attackers to bypass authentication and authorization checks and access to sensitive functionality. You can see that in the, in the paper. And well, many more things that unfortunately, uh, some things are waiting for patches and some things uh, cannot, we cannot just make it fit into one hour talk. So conclusions. Uh, Actually, we, there is really um, a lot of SAP systems connected online, so if someone tells you that his SAP system is all internal, uh, make a double check on that. Obviously, this increases a lot of the risk because uh, the universe of possible attackers is widened and the chances to catch them quite reduced. As I told you, there are uh, many different kind of web technologies from SAP, so it's really important and they are like completely different one to each other, the security models or the authentication model, authentication, everything is different. So you have to know really well uh, the specific component that you're trying to secure. Uh, as I told you, SAP is getting better in this. There are new security guides. Since last year, they're starting releasing uh, regular security patch days. So that's kind of cool. Um, and there are some recommendations that organizations should follow. As I told you, there are things that are documented since 2006 and people are still not following that. Um, don't connect the SAP system directly to the internet. At least use a reverse proxy or a web application firewall. And uh, if I want you to take one thing out of the talk is that remember that if someone exploits a vulnerability in an SAP web component, uh, a remote attacker may be able to get full control of the SAP system and access all the business information in that system. Not just technical data or get uh, pop up a shell out of it, but get access to credit card data, to human resources data, to financial results, everything that's stored in the system. Um, so I really think that this is the, the, the only way to manage this kind of threats. Uh, what I think it's, I mean, when we started with us, all this SAP research, there was like some, um, some people that were not very keen on that and, and they thought that it was better to keep it quiet. But ultimately I think that it was not a very good position for, for, for actually companies or users because they didn't know the threats that they were facing. So uh, what I just want to make them know the threats that they're facing if then business decides that it's a risk that they can take 
That's perfectly fine with me, but it's important for them to be aware of the threats.